In this video, we'll be investigating circular motion, how we can use the circular motion experiment to determine the value of the gravitational field strength, G. So you have in front of you a basic diagram of the apparatus used with the circular motion experiment. It consists of a rubber stopper on a string of a fixed radius that's rotated around in a circular motion. There's a masking tape on the string that keeps the radius fixed to a certain amount as you swing that around. There's a tube that can be held onto to allow the rotation of the rubber stopper without impeding it. And there's a set of masses down the bottom that generate a weight force. So the traditional circular motion equation is mv squared on r, where m is the mass of the rubber stopper that's been colored red. So as that rotates around with a velocity at a fixed radius, it generates a centripetal force. And of course, in this scenario, that's being balanced by the gravitational force of the mass set. So as you're using this apparatus, the rubber stopper rotates around generating a centripetal force, which is balanced by the gravitational force of the mass set. The idea of this investigation is to measure the time it takes for 10 rotations to allow you to calculate the period from which we can work out the velocity, the centripetal force, and equate that to the gravitational force of the mass set. We do that for six different variations of radius, and from that we can calculate the gravitational field strength G of Earth. The following visual also shows a good representation of this experiment. So we have a mass on the end of a string at a fixed radius, spinning in a circle, the centripetal force of which is balanced out by the weight force, or the force due to gravity of the attached washers. Let's see how this simulation works. Here's our circular motion. The O-Physics simulator represents this situation very well. You can see on the screen a red mass rotating around in a circular orbit at a fixed radius. From the top view, this is clearly circular motion, as also can be seen from the side view. Let's now use Excel spreadsheet to analyze our results. So first of all, you can see in our table, we have the mass set, and I've used a dark blue M to represent the mass of the mass set. Whereas below that table, we have data referring to the rubber stopper, its radius of one meter and its mass of 50 grams or 0 0.05 of a kilogram. Now I've used the little red M to represent the mass of the rubber stopper, so I don't get the two M's confused. So in this particular table, we have the time taken for 10 cycles. Trial one, trial two, trial three, for the six different mass sets. And we need to work out the average of each for a start. A pretty easy calculation to make. Let's examine how we've done this for the 100 gram mass set. We take trial one, trial two, trial three, we add them together, and divide by three. So it's just simply working out the average for each particular mass set. And we do that. Next, we want to work out the period. The average values we just calculated are the measured times on average for 10 revolutions or cycles for each particular mass set. However, we want for our purpose of calculation, the period, just the time for one. So in order to change from an average of 10 cycles to a single period, we take each individual average and divide it by 10. So in this first example I have here for the 100 gram mass set, the average time for 10 cycles is 14.19 seconds. When I divide that by 10, I get 1.42 rounded to two decimal places and perform the same calculations for each of the six mass sets. From this period, we're going to work out the speed of the rubber stopper flying around for each one of these different mass sets. Now the speed is calculated by using two pi r over t. You can see r is the radius, it's in purple. Um, it's a value of one meter. And in this example, I'm using the period for the 100 gram mass set of 1.42 seconds. So two pi r over t, that allows us to calculate the speed for each one of these different masses. Finally, we want to calculate the centripetal force. As we know, centripetal force is equal to mv squared on r, where importantly, m is the mass of the rubber stopper, shown in red of 50 grams or 0 0.05 of a kilogram. r is the radius of the rubber stopper, being one meter, and the speed is taken from the previous column that we just calculated. So this first particular cell for the 100 gram mass set, I'm going to have a calculation of 0.5 times 4.43 squared over one. And I'll repeat that for all the different mass sets. So there's our completed set of data. It has the mass sets, it's the time taken on average for 10 cycles. From that, we've calculated the period, the velocity, and the centripetal force. Let's now analyze our data. So I've generated here a graph showing centripetal force on the vertical axis, that's our dependent variable, and the mass set on the horizontal axis, that's our independent variable. 
So step number one is to plot the data. Step number two is add a trend line, as can be seen here in red. Step number three is to use Excel and add a linear equation. So Excel has generated the following linear equation. It tells us that this line has the relationship of y equals 9.80 times x. Let's now examine this linear equation in the context of this data set. The general rule for a linear equation is y equals mx plus c, where y is the dependent variable, m is the gradient, x is the independent variable, and c is the y-intercept. So first of all, in this context, let's look at what the variable y, the dependent variable, represents. So in this context, it's the centripetal force, fc, that is the dependent variable. m is the gradient, and xl has provided a gradient of 9.80, and we substitute that into our linear equation. x is the independent variable. In this case, it's the mass set, little m. So we place that in our equation. And finally, c, the y-intercept. We can see here this trend line intercepts at the origin. So it has a y-intercept of zero. So here's our linear equation in terms of the variables and data that we've just collected. Our equation is the centripetal force equals 9.80 times the mass set m. So from our theory, we know centripetal force classically is equal to mv squared on r. But in this scenario, it's being generated by the mass set, which has a force due to gravity of mg. Now in this context, the little m represents the mass of the mass set. So let's use that equation. We can rearrange that to say that the centripetal force is equal to g times m, and there's benefits for that which we'll examine shortly. So now we have an equation from our actual data, the linear equation. Fc equals 9.80 times m, where m is the mass of the mass set. And we also have from our known theory, Fc, the centripetal force, is equal to g times m. Observant viewers will see that the left-hand side of equation 1 is equal to the left-hand side of equation 2. Both equations have Fc, the centripetal force, on the left-hand side. So if the left-hand sides of both equations are equal, mathematically, the right-hand sides of both equations must be equal. And we can state that as 9.80 times m is equal to g times m. We can now divide both sides by the variable of m, the mass set, and that leaves me with the equation 9.80 equals g. Rewritten, this is g equals 9.8 newtons per kilogram, which is the theoretical value for the gravitational field strength on planet Earth.